Welcome to Bible Answers Live, where you'll get honest answers to your Bible questions. Let's face it, it's not always easy to understand everything you read in the Bible. With 66 books and more than 700,000 words, the Bible can generate a lot of questions. If you'd like answers to your Bible questions, you've come to the right place. Now, here's your host, Pastor Doug Batchelor, President and Speaker of Amazing Facts. Welcome, listening friends. Would you like to hear an amazing fact? Normally, when we think of flowers, we picture something small, delicate, and fragrant. Those are probably not the words you'd use to describe a flower found growing in the rainforest of Sumatra. It's known as the Titan Arum. This giant flower can take between seven to 10 years to produce its first bloom. When it does bloom, you'll know it. The flower looks like an eight foot long loaf of French bread protruding straight up from a deep burgundy and green pleated skirt that surrounds the base. One record breaking specimen in a botanical garden in New Hampshire had a central spike more than 10 feet high and leaves 13 feet around. And this plant is heavy too, with some specimens weighing in at over 300 pounds. The Titan Arum is also known as the corpse flower because when it does bloom, it emits a sickening smell. Some have described the odor as a cross between dirty socks, garlic, Limburger cheese, and rotten fish. And I bet you're glad you're being protected by radio right now. The plant puts off a rotten smell for about 48 hours to attract flies and beetles that help pollinate it. The corpse flower is also one of the only plants that can generate its own heat through a chemical reaction reaching 98 degrees when in full bloom. It's hard to imagine such a large, majestic flower that stinks. The Bible says Satan's counterfeits often work the same way. Stay with us, friends. We're going to learn more on this edition of Bible Answers Live. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, honest answers to your Bible questions. This broadcast is a previously recorded episode. To receive any of the Bible resources mentioned in this evening's program, call 800-835-6747. Once again, that's 800-835-6747. Now, let's join our host, Pastor Doug Batchelor, and our co-host, Pastor Jean Ross. Welcome, listening friends, to Bible Answers Live, and we're here to do our best to answer your Bible questions. If you have a question... Lines are wide open now. Good time to pick up your phone. Give us a call. That number is 800-GOD-SAYS. Call in with your Bible questions. It's a free phone call, of course, in North America. 800-463-7297. And as the title suggests, this is an international Bible study. We invite you to call in, talk about the Word of God, the most important book. My name is Doug Batchelor. My name is John Ross. Good evening, friends. Pastor Doug, as usual, let's start the program with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity once again to open up your word and study together. We want to ask your blessing upon this program. Be with those who are listening, Lord. Guide us into a clear understanding of the Bible. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Doug, you opened the program by talking about a remarkable flower that, first of all, it's big. It's I, Looking at a picture of it online a little early, actually, there was one occasion when uh, I was uh, in D.C. and uh, this particular plant was flowering there at uh, one of the museums and people formed a long line to go in and look at it. It wasn't smelling by the time we made it in, but it's quite impressive. It is a big flower and yet the strange thing about it is it's got this terrible smell that is irresistible to certain bugs and flies. Yeah, it's the opposite of the kind of flower that would attract a a butterfly looking for a fragrance. Uh, This one is, it's supposed to imitate the uh, the stench of carrion and that's also they suspect that it, it's made where it uh, also puts off heat like something decomposing and so it's uh, hot it's red in the middle and it stinks and flies just love it of course they come disappointed they don't find anything they're deceived into coming but in the process they are used by the flower to pollinate and um, but it's deceptive because when you look at the flower from the distance, it, it's, you know, got a big yellow stalk coming out of that red skirt and, and it's majestic looking. You get close and you take a whiff. I actually saw YouTube showed people's faces. It may have been the one there at the Botanical Gardens in Washington, D.C. Showed all these people lined up coming to see the flower and they get close and they just turn up their noses. Uh, but it only makes that terrible smell for a little while. 
anyway, it's, you know, here you get a flower. It's masquerading as a flower, but it really stinks. And uh, in the Bible, Jesus warns that the devil will sometimes look like a sheep, but he's really a wolf. And so many of the deceptions that the devil has in the Bible, he counterfeits something good and he replaces it with something dangerous or deadly or, or uh, deceptive. And uh, that's his practice. The devil's got a counterfeit for love. He's got a counterfeit for the gift of tongues. The devil has a counterfeit baptisms. You can name just about any doctrine. And he's taken all these various truths and he's got a counterfeit. And it'll look good from a distance, but on closer investigation, it doesn't smell right. It doesn't mm-hmm. pass the smell test, as they say. And uh, maybe you'd like to understand better what some of these counterfeits are and how you can spot them, friends. We have a free offer tonight for you on that subject. We have a book that's entitled Satan's Confusing Counterfeits, and this is a free offer for anyone who will call and ask. The phone line to call for this free offer, 800-835-6747, and you can ask for the book called Satan's Confusing Counterfeits. That number again is 800-835-6747. And ask for the book, Satan's Confusing Counterfeits. And friends, if you didn't know, we're also streaming live this evening on uh, Facebook, on the Amazing Facts Facebook page. And I know I think pass it out on your page yeah, as well. Yeah, the Doug so Bachelor like Facebook page. So we'd like to those who are joining us on Facebook. And if you have a Bible question, you might want to give us a call here. The number to call is 800-463-7297. And that will bring your call right in here to the studio. First caller that we have this evening is Stephanie listening in New Mexico. Stephanie, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you. Thank you. And your question tonight? Okay, my question comes out of James 3, um, 6 6 and 8, where it talks about the tongue is a fire of iniquity, uh, how it defiles the whole body. Um, And then 8, where it says, no man can tame the tongue. It's unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. Um, So I struggle with some anger, bitterness, wrath that I'm working on. And so my tongue is not tamed at all. And I pray all the time. And we came across this scripture at church um, today. And so what is the answer to taming the tongue? Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And as you mentioned, you know, if you're struggling with anger, it's going to be hard to repress that and not to voice the the anger, the bitterness or whatever you're going through. It requires really a a transformation of the heart. And, uh, you know, when when we're born again, uh, no man can tame the tongue, but the Lord can change our hearts. And that ends up changing our words. And it is very important for us to, you know, pray that God will help us get victory over our words because... In Matthew 12, Jesus also said that uh, in the judgment, we'll give an account for every idle word that we speak for you. By your words, you'll be condemned and by your words, you'll be justified. Now, of course, all of us have said things we shouldn't say. And all of us need to ask that God will forgive us for reckless speaking. But, you know, when we get a new heart, we then pray the Lord will help us to say those things that are positive, good, pure, kind. And it may not happen overnight. But as our hearts are transformed, our words change. Uh, just a very a quick and uh, kind of a simplistic illustration. Before I was a Christian, um, I, you know, had a very foul mouth, uh, you know, with the, the, the druggies I was hanging out with back in those days. You know, we just used right. all the curse words and I probably still know them all. But uh once the Lord got a hold of my heart, I began to feel, you know, Jesus wouldn't talk like that. And I want to follow Jesus. And little by little, I'd catch myself. The Holy Spirit would just stop me when I was about to say one of those words, or I'd say it and then I'd feel so bad I wouldn't do it anymore. And, mm-hmm. you know, I don't have that problem anymore. The Lord changed my heart. He changed my tongue. And uh, it's not that uh, there isn't still room for growth, but I've just witnessed firsthand when God changes your heart, it can change your words. Okay, that's awesome. Do you have a resource on anger or taming the tongue, anything like that? We do. Roots of bitterness, anything like that? Yeah, we have a a little book that I think you'll find very interesting called uh, Tips for Resisting Temptation. And it deals with those principles of a change of heart, how to control one's uh, temper or attitude. It'll, It'll be in there. It'll address that. And we'll be happy to send that to you for free. Again, the book is called Tips for Resisting Temptation. 
And the number to call okay, for that great. is 800-463-7297. Now, wait a minute. That's the number here to the studio. You just call that number. <laughs> but the number for our resource is 800-835-6747. You know, there's another book you can also read for free online, Stephanie, and it's specifically on the subject of speaking, and it's called um, Tiny Troublemaker. Oh, yeah. That's a good one, too. And it talks about, when you, it talks about if you wrestle with gossip, but it'll have some of the same verses that we talked about. You can read that for free at The Amazing Facts. Uh, well, both books are free, but you can read that one right now for free at the Amazing Facts website. You just type in Tiny, Tiny Troublemaker, and you type in Joe Cruz. It'll probably pull it up right away. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate your call. Next caller that we have is Jerry, listening in Oregon. Jerry, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you, Pastors Ross and Bachelor. About a year ago, I asked a question about a white lie or a justified lie, and Pastor Doug said a lie is a lie, basically, uh, categorically. And I realized that in Revelation, it says all liars are excluded from the holy city. But I was just rereading Exodus 1, and it gave an account where Pharaoh ordered two midwives to kill all the baby boys, and they didn't do it. And then... Pharaoh asked them why they didn't do it, and they responded, because Hebrew women are more vigorous and they give birth before we can get there, which was a lie, basically. And then in chapter 20, or verse 20 of chapter 1, it says, So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. Now, that technically was a lie, but obviously it was a justified lie. So why would God bless them? Because it seems like the Lord would be bending his own rules, huh? Well, to an extent, I mean, it, you know, he obviously one is not supposed to kill children either. But again, they were put in a difficult position and they gave a, you know, offered a, a justified lie. You know, my guess is it's interesting you would ask this because I read that verse this week. Uh, and you know, I do the same thing, Pastor Doug. I, I hear things, and I, I just studied them a couple of days before. It's happened so many times, but that's a digression. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. I know it's uh, amazing how the Lord does that. But, uh, you know, I thought about that this week, and in the answer the ladies gave, because here they are the midwives for this nation of Israel, you read in Exodus, it says, God bless them, and they increased greatly. I think two or three times as they multiplied very greatly. So much so the Egyptians are saying, what are we going to do? These guys are just, you know, they're becoming so numerous. Those midwives, two midwives, and it names them. It's very unusual that it actually yeah. gives their names. And it says, God bless them. There probably were times when they got there and the baby was already born. And so I think maybe they were citing a couple of cases where it was true that they got there before they were, you know, the babies were already born by the time they got there. I'm sure that was a partial truth. So I would agree with you that they also had just decided we are not going to kill these babies. And, um, you know, the Lord winks at our ignorance sometimes. It's like he blessed Rahab when she lied and said, oh, the messengers went out the gate. You better run after him. What she did was a bold face lie. But, you know, she was a pagan. She was doing the best she could. And with those midwives, you know, the Israelites in Egypt, they were not uh, obeying all of God's commandments. And I think he winked at their ignorance. It doesn't mean that God blesses lying. It just means that he meets people where they're at. They were frightened. They didn't want to die. They didn't want to hurt any of the babies. And so God blessed them. But, yeah, well, God always wants us note, to tell the truth. On a, on a similar note, supposing I, I approach you and I say, Pastor Doug, I'd like to show you a picture of my granddaughter. She's a beautiful child. I swear someday she's going to be Miss America. And I show you the picture and you think, well, this little girl's going to have to go through quite a metamorphosis. I mean, you're probably going to say, yeah, she's a beautiful girl. I mean, that's really not a terrible thing. Is <laughs> that's it? an unfair question. Can we go to the next caller, please? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, that is something that when you're a pastor and you're at the door, you know, frequently people come out and they'll say, here's our new baby. And you look at some of the babies are just adorable. Well, I guess they're all adorable to the mothers. And some are better looking than others, I think we'll all admit. But, boy, you're in trouble if you say anything other than that's a beautiful baby. <laughs> so, you know, you got us there that uh, I think sometimes just out of uh, graciousness, we speak with a little bit of hyperbole and we tell everybody, oh, your kids are adorable and so forth. 
and that's sort of just considered good manners. But uh, you're right. If you, you're probably not going to get very far in life if you tell everybody everything you think about them. Uh, you know yeah, what I mean? The, the example, the example I two cited, the two examples I cited, there was no malicious intent. That, that that's right. I still think Christians should always be honest. I think you need to be kind. And there are times when you don't say everything you're thinking. Even Christ said to the disciples, there's many things I have to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, he said, you, you just, it's like you don't tell a five-year-old everything about the birds and the bees because they just can't handle it at that age. So, you know, not saying everything you know, there's biblical reasons for that because timing is important. But I don't think we should ever be dishonest or misleading. We should be transparent and just pray for diplomacy if you see an ugly baby. Hey, thank you very much for your question. And uh, that's a good question. Our next call is Gina listening in Ohio. Gina, welcome to the program. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, Thanks I, for calling. Well, you're welcome. It's good to talk to you. Um, I have a question about the Sabbath. Um, I've always felt really guilty um, about because when you always have your utilities on, your gas, your electric, there's no way to shut them off. Mm-hmm. And I've always felt really bad because, I mean, I'm making somebody work, you know, at these companies. Is there anything biblically that, that says that, I mean, he tell, you know, tells us not to work or make anybody else work, but I guess I feel guilty about. You know, yeah, well, that, that is a good practical question. I think, you know, all of us would agree that we're thankful that on the Sabbath day, our phones are working and power is still on in the house. And, and we know there's people out there that are operating those services. Uh, Jesus, one time someone said, Lord, uh, I, you know, I want to follow you, but first I've got to bury my father. And Jesus said something a little disturbing. He said, let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. Uh, we can't mm-hmm. control what everybody does. Um, and, you know, um, there are going to be people that will be doing that, that don't know the Lord. You know, let them do it. Um, and But we shouldn't be doing it. I don't know if that makes sense. Um well, you know, Help me, Pastor Ross. And, you know, the <laughs> on and the gas is on, and it's well, just... You know, I think, first of all, if, let's just say you turn off all the power or you disconnect the gas uh, for 24 hours, will that have uh-huh. any impact upon the people that are actually working in the utilities, uh, getting power and gas to hundreds of homes throughout the city? It's not going to make no. It's not going to make any difference to them. They're still going to be. They're doing still the going to be thing. doing their job. So you know, it's yeah. a little different if you are hiring someone specifically to come and hook up your power on the Sabbath. That's a little different. But here's someone that's doing a job. They're going to be doing it whether you use the power or you don't use the power. Um, it's kind of out of your control. It's out of your. Um, you yeah. don't have direction in, in Sabbath commandment work. says that within your house within your gates yeah, yeah. you know we're, we're really only able to control mm-hmm. what happens within our gates and you know if you own the power company that might be different that would be different yeah. <laughs> and we want to talk yeah. to you about something else if you own the power company <laughs> yeah that's true alright well thank you very much I appreciate that thank you appreciate your question next caller that we have is uh, Michael listening in Michigan Michael welcome to the program hey guys can you hear me Loud and clear. Awesome. I figured you could. I just wanted to make sure I have, you know, to speak through these uh, headphones that I have. Um, I know I called last week about evil spirits, but um, is there the question I have about other denominations? Does the Bible specifically say that all, meaning, you know, Catholic or whatever, every denomination will be in heaven? Like, where are the Bible texts for that? Because I have a lot of people saying that, you know, that Adventists are not the only ones going to heaven. I've had countless people, have countless people saying that to me, and just like, well, I don't know what the Bible verses are, but I have well, heard that every denomination will be in heaven. I'm like, well, okay. Let me, yeah, let me back, uh, let me just back up to uh, restate the question a little bit. And if you've got your radio on in the background, you may want to turn that down because we're getting feedback from that. Um, I don't think, I hope there aren't people out there that think only one denomination is going to be in heaven. Uh, Jesus is pretty clear that there are people who were born Jewish that aren't going to be saved just because they're Jewish. Uh, you know, he said those who don't uh, follow the truth, they're children of the devil. It doesn't matter what denomination you're in. And there are people in the church that uh, are going to be in heaven. Uh, the Lord said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also I must call, and there will be one fold and one shepherd. I think that's John chapter 10. 
Um, so, you know, there's gonna there, there's good people if they're living up to the scriptural truth that they have. Um, you know, God doesn't judge us by what we don't know. Uh, another way I might say that there'll be people in heaven like King David and Solomon that had you know scores of wives. Well, we know that's wrong. It's not true that you should have that many wives. There'll be people in heaven that maybe didn't understand what the Bible says about clean and unclean food. Well, they didn't know. God winks at their ignorance. The Bible says, now he commands everyone to repent. When you know the truth, Hebrews chapter 10 says, sin is knowing to do good and not doing it. And so God is not looking on denominational roles to see who is saved. He's looking at, are we living up to the light that he's given us? So, uh, you know, we've got a book that I think helps answer that. It's called Search for the True Church. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to send that to anybody who calls and asks, what are the biblical characteristics that are given for God's people nowadays? Uh, We'll be happy to send that to you. The number to call is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the book called The Search for the True Church. Our next caller that we have is, let's see, we've got um, Vernon listening in uh, New York. Vernon, welcome to the program. Hey, how you guys doing? Good. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Um, I've asked this question before, and I never got a good, solid answer to this question, so I'm going to present this to both of you. Um, When it comes to God, he's omniscient. He has the ability of omnipresent, and he's omnipotent. Am I correct on those three things? Yes. Okay. Uh, Sin first started in heaven and not on earth. Am I correct in that? Yes. Okay. Now let's go down to the earth. When God had created Adam and Eve, he put forth a tree in the garden called the tree of uh, good and evil. Uh, This is my question, and I'll hang up to hear your answer. Since God has these three attributes... If that tree wasn't there, there would have been no sin on earth, nor would Christ have had to come to die on the cross, and people on the earth would live forever, because we know Satan came down and tempted Eve, and Eve brought forth the fruit to her husband, and God had to bring judgment upon all three for the sin that was committed. So here's my question. Why did God put that tree there, and should not that tree had not been there? Have a nice day. All right. Hey, thank you very much for your question. Uh, Well, when uh, the tree was placed in the garden, the tree was actually there to limit the ways that Satan could access this new world. Uh, God told Adam and Eve, he said, look, you know, there's been a rebellion in the universe, and one of the highest of our creations has chosen a way of selfishness and sin, And uh, he is going through the universe. He's got limited access to uh, recruit people to his side. Do not go to this tree. This is a forbidden tree. And Adam and Eve were warned that that tree might be the gateway to evil coming into their lives. In order for God to give all of his creatures freedom, he had to give them the opportunity to make a decision. Uh, So really the tree, if the tree wasn't here, it wouldn't have kept the devil from coming into our world. And tempting Adam and Eve, it would have been on some other ground. But God just restricted. He said, look, I'm going to give you one restriction, and it's just this tree. And it's the only place where Satan is going to be able to access this world to tempt. And so, uh, yeah, God made all of his creatures free. And in order to really be free and to choose to love him, we have to have um, the opportunity to make a choice. So he gave them that opportunity. You know, you would really enjoy a DVD that we produce that goes into more detail talking about where did sin come from and, and, you know, what if God had done things differently? What would have happened? It's called Cosmic Conflict. I think you can just YouTube Cosmic Conflict or go to the Amazing Facts YouTube channel and you can watch the whole thing for free right there online. Our next caller that we have is Dennis listening in Vacaville. Dennis, welcome to the program. Uh, Thank you very much and thank you for being there to, to help all of us. Well, it's a blessing. Um, we got about yes. four minutes or three minutes before the break, Dennis, so let's get okay. right to your question. As God uh, has foresight and prophesied uh, and foretold of end-time signs, I was wondering, are there any verses 
that nearly describe some of these modern things that we do. People flying in the air, in airplanes like birds, or flying around the earth or traveling to the moon, and Um, or such a thing as uh, nuclear bombs wiping out whole cities. Well, let me give you a couple of verses that have been pointed to. In Daniel chapter 12, uh, Daniel says, Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will increase. That's a pretty broad statement, but he's talking Mm -hmm. about people going to and fro. They already went to and fro in his day, but they did it on horseback. Now Mm -hmm. they're going to and fro. People travel, you know, hundreds of miles, thousands of miles from the place of their birth. They didn't used to do that. People often never went more than 50 miles from their birthplace in their entire life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was one thing. And he says knowledge will increase. He didn't say wisdom would increase because people aren't really much wiser today than they used to be. But knowledge and technology has increased greatly. And, uh, you know, Jesus said, except those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved implying that man would have the ability to destroy himself. And I forget, Pastor Ross, in in Revelation, is it chapter 11, where it says God will destroy those that destroy the earth? Mm -hmm. Revelation 11. Yeah. And uh, so man did not have the ability to destroy the earth when John wrote the book of Revelation. But man certainly has the technology and the ability through chemicals, pollution, nuclear weapons to destroy the earth now. So that's just a handful, but it sounds to me, brother, like you'd really enjoy our study guide talking about the second coming, and it goes into some of the signs of the second coming as well. And that's called the ultimate deliverance? The ultimate deliverance. We'll be happy to send it to anybody who calls and asks. The number is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the study guide called the ultimate deliverance, all about the second coming. And it talks about signs that relate to the second coming. Absolutely. Now, uh, we're going to be taking a break in just a moment. Uh, Pastor Ross and I were going to tell you before we go to the break that if you've not seen it before, for the students out there that enjoy Bible study, there is a website called BibleHistory.com, and it has a Bible timeline. I think it's one of the more popular Bible timelines you'll find on the Internet. And you can look at the scope all the way from creation. You can see where the major events occurred and track all the way from creation down through Um, up to the second coming. Not that we don't set a date for that, but, you know, it shows that it's next on the calendar. So just check out BibleHistory.com. And uh, again, want to tell you we have lines open. If you give us a call, 800-463-7297. Want to greet again our friends that are watching on Facebook. You can join them if you are curious what it looks like here in the studio. That's simply Amazing Facts Facebook page. We're going to be back in just a few moments. Stay tuned. Bible Answers Live will return in a moment. Amazing Facts began in 1965 with a God-inspired concept. Hello, this is Joe Cruz on the Amazing Facts broadcast, Facts Which Affect You. Each radio broadcast would begin with an amazing fact from science, nature, or history, followed by a Bible message that touched the hearts of listeners from every walk of life. The program was an instant success, and the ministry soon began expanding to include Bible lessons. In 1986, Amazing Facts added the medium of television to its growing outreach efforts, offering soul-winning evangelistic messages for viewers around the world. In 1994, Pastor Doug Batchelor assumed leadership of the ministry, adding the Bible Answers Live call-in radio program, and new ministry TV programs began airing on multiple networks around the world. For 50 years, the driving vision of Amazing Facts has been the bold proclamation of the everlasting gospel. And with a team of evangelists circling the globe and thousands of men and women being trained through the Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism program, AFCO, the ministry is helping God's church see a rich harvest of souls. Amazing Facts, God's message, our mission. Every Bible question you have answered moves you one step closer to the fullness of God's will for your life. So what are you waiting for? Get the answers you need for a fuller, richer, more confident life. 
You're listening to Bible Answers Live. This broadcast is a previously recorded episode. If you'd like answers to your Bible-related questions on the air, please call us next Sunday between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Pacific Time. To receive any of the Bible resources mentioned in this evening's program, call 800-835-6747. Once again, that's 800-835-6747. Now, let's join Pastors Doug Batchelor and John Ross for more Bible Answers Live. Welcome back, listening friends. This is Bible Answers Live. If you tuned in along the way, we're glad you joined us. It's a live, international, interactive Bible study. And you can call in with your questions. Free phone call, 800-463-7297. And uh, we're also broadcasting this on Facebook at the Amazing Facts Facebook page and Doug Batchelor's Facebook page. I am Doug Batchelor. My name is John Ross, and we're going to go to the phone lines. We've got a caller who has a question about Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to see if we can get a hold of him. Uh, question related to Daniel 9. Are you listening? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, you're on the air. Okay, sweet. Um, Daniel nine twenty five, where it says, Now therefore, and under- or know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be so many weeks. Um my understanding is that um, this prophecy started in Ezra chapter 7 with the decree of Artaxerxes. Um, but my question was, why did it not start in uh, Ezra chapter 1 instead of with the, decree of Cy- uh, with the um, decree of Cyrus, where Cyrus is telling Ezra to basically go and build the temple? So, um, Yeah, that's a good why- question. Uh, and the reason I answer the first decree, there were actually three decrees. The first decree that was given allowed the Jews to go back and start rebuilding the temple. Uh, their work was stopped, and so the same decree was given again to kind of just allow them through Darius to continue finishing the temple. But it was the third decree by Artaxerxes in 457 BC which allowed them to rebuild Jerusalem, and that involved building a wall around the city. And if you look in verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. And that was really the third decree that allowed them to actually rebuild the city and the wall. And the, yeah, the last part of the verse says, and the street and the wall will be built again in mm-hmm. troublous times. It specifies oh, the hey, wall. Oh, look at that. Okay. And of course, the whole book of Nehemiah is about rebuilding the wall. Uh-huh. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Hey, good question. Now, we've got a whole study on Daniel 9 that just is uh, outstanding. Uh, would that be uh, right on time? Yes. An or is that God Dan- sets a date for the judgment? I, we got two lessons there. Well, I think both are good. They both touch on Daniel 9. But, um, but let me give you both. You can just call and ask for them. We'll be happy to send it to you. The one study guide deals with a right on time, which uh, deals with Daniel 9. And the other one is God set a date for the judgment. We'll be happy to send those two studies to anybody who asks. The number is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the study guide dealing with Daniel chapter 9. It's uh, God set a date for the judgment and right on time are the names of the two lessons. Our next caller that we have is Doug listening in Minnesota. Doug, welcome to the program. Hi, uh, Doug. Uh, I have a question uh, about how God is going to deal with the wicked after the after the thousand year period. Yeah, well, you read in Revelation 20 that it tells us about the wicked that they um, surround the beloved city as if they're going to attack it. And by the way, what you find in Revelation 20 about Gog and Magog also is found is it Ezekiel 37 Pastor Ross I think Ezekiel 37 and 38 talk about Gog and Magog, but it depicts some of the same scenes where these enemies of God surround the city of God and there's a, you know, a great white throne judgment and ultimately fire comes down from God out of heaven, forms a great lake of fire and, and all the wicked are punished according to what they deserve. I think yeah, the parallel passage in the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 38, talks 38. about Gog and Magog and yeah. the destruction that comes. Yeah, so, uh, and that's at the conclusion of the 1,000 years. It says, the rest of the dead do not live until the 1,000 years are finished. Well, if the dead in Christ rise first, the rest of the dead are the wicked. You get the dead in Christ, that's the righteous. The rest of the dead is everybody who isn't saved, that's the lost. 
They come forth at the end of the 1,000 years, and when they realize they're permanently doomed, Satan tries to rally them to a final assault on the city of God, and that's when judgment happens and uh, punishment. So, you know, we have, we have a study guide we can send you on that for free, and it's got, um, it's called... Can I say something? I'm sorry, go ahead. Can I say something? Yeah. We're told that some will um, die, uh, will live on for a number of days, so it sounds like they don't die instantly. The wicked. Yeah, it does talk about, yeah, it says that, speaking more particularly about the devil, it's, it talks about day and night. Uh, how long individuals will suffer varies because the Bible tells us that each man is rewarded according to his work. But, uh, you know, we're in that group of Protestants. We do believe in hell and the lake of fire. We don't believe that people are going to burn for zillions of years for the sins of one lifetime. It's longer than zillions. Some people believe they're going to burn forever and ever. And the Bible tells us there is going to come a world where there's no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow. All things are made new. And so we see that um, uh, ultimately, it says the wicked are burned up. That's Malachi chapter 4. And uh, we do have a study guide I was going to tell you about the subject of the millennium. And that title is? A thousand Years of Peace. Yeah, we'll, we'll send that to you. To anyone who calls and That's asks. a test. <laughs> The number is uh, 800-835-6747. You can ask the study guide called A Thousand Years of Peace. You can actually read that study guide for free online as well. Our next caller is Donna, listening in California. Donna, welcome to the program. Thank you. I appreciate you taking my call. Um, my question deals with the book of Revelation. Um, chapter 14, verse 9 through 11. What I'm wanting to know is who is going to have to be present to, during the destruction of the wicked, basically. Because uh, what I'm reading here in chapter 10 is that it's only going to be the holy angels and the Lamb that will be present. So I'm hoping it means that we won't have to watch this. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't know how close our seats will be. But uh, I hope you, they're not you, there at all. <laughs> you've got, uh, you know, obviously the wicked are being punished after the second coming of the resurrection. And since we are with Jesus and we are being gathered by the angels, I think it's understood that we're still in the neighborhood when this happens. Um, because it, it does say the presence of the Lamb and the holy angels, but, uh, you know, I think that... Uh, you know, if you're talking about there. the destruction of the wicked that occurs at the second coming of Christ, if you read the sequence given in the Bible... I don't think our focus is going to be much on what's happening on the earth when Jesus comes. Our prime focus right. will be up in the air. We'll be looking up. Christ will be on the cloud. The angels will be there. We'll be caught up. There will be a glorious resurrection. And loved ones will meet again. So the real focus for the redeemed is not going to be what's happening behind them. They're not going to be looking over their shoulder. They're going to be looking up into the air. And they're going to be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. It'll be a glorious event. It'll be sort of the climax of uh, the history. Human history is when Jesus comes. Um, the response okay. of the wicked, Revelation chapter 6 says, They turn to the rocks and mountains and say, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of his wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? So the okay. wicked so are torment. gripped with fear. Yeah. yeah. So this torment and torture that happens at the same time as the righteous are being raised, this is a part of that? Well, there's two destructions of the wicked. You have the first destruction that occurs when Jesus yeah. comes. but the, then That's the, the end, living wicked. The living wicked. Yeah. And then at the end of the 1,000 years, you have what the Bible calls the great white throne judgment that you read about in Revelation chapter 20, where all the wicked are resurrected for the final judgment. Then they mount this uh, last effort to try and attack the golden city, the new Jerusalem, and Revelation says fire comes and devours them. So the righteous will be inside the city, they'll be safe, but the wicked are outside the city and they are consumed by the fire. Now, there is a verse where you read in Luke chapter thirteen twenty-eight, where he says, you know, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets, all the saved in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. So it does seem that there's at least a brief point where the saved are going to see who's saved and the lost are going to see who's lost and, and uh, there's going to be a, a very sobering moment at that time. And I believe she'd also enjoy the study guide you mentioned on the millennium, the thousand, thousand years, years of peace. peace. Yes. And we have a study guide on the judgment too. 
Right? Both of them would be good. And they deal with the subject, Revelation 20. Just call and ask for the study guide called A Thousand Years of Peace. And your day in court. send that to you. And also Your Day in Court, I believe, is what it's called. I think that might be the name of the book, but we can send yeah. that as well. The number is 800-835-6747. That is the resource phone line. We're going to go to our next caller who is listening in Washington. We have Lee. Lee, welcome to the program. Hi. Can, can you guys hear me? We can. Okay. So um, my question is, the Bible teaches us that we should love our enemies. Does that mean that God still loves and has compassion for Satan, who is our ultimate enemy? Well, that's a good question. You know, the Bible says God is love. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that God stops being love, even though the, the devil has rebelled. You ha keep in mind, uh, a parent might have a child that turns into a real rebel, but that doesn't mean that the parent stops loving them, even if they're thrown in jail on death row. And so I don't know that God stops being love. Uh, the Lord doesn't like what Satan has become, which is he's become consummate selfishness and evil. But um, we're not being encouraged to love the devil <laughs> when he says love your enemies. I think that the love that we have for our enemies is, you know, Jesus, his love broke people's hearts and converted them. The devil is never going to be converted. He's never going to repent. And so I don't think we ought to waste that kind of affection for him. His doom is sealed. But, I, yeah, I don't, whether God stops loving is a different question. And um, it's, uh, yeah. It's hard for us to comprehend, but he is a God of love. But there's no no salvation for the devil. Thank you, Lee. We turned your volume down a little bit because we had some background sound effects. And uh, did that answer your question? Yes. It did. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And we do have a study guide that says, did God create a devil? And it talks a little bit about that subject. To receive that, just call our resource phone line. That's 800-835-6747. And you can ask for the study guide called, Did God Create a Devil? Our next caller is Orlando, or it is somebody calling from Orlando. I'm not quite sure. Uh, Orlando, you on the air? Oh, hey, this is Ken from Orlando. Tim, all right. Well, the reason we had to ask that is, believe it or not, Pastor Doug and I know a pastor who lives in Orlando, and his first name is Orlando. Yes. So <laughs> I wanted to make sure... <laughs> Well, my question is, you know, I'm a little confused because as a New Testament believer, we're always taught that, you know, Jesus is the only way to the Father, the only way to go to heaven. And my question is, as it was, you know, when, with, with Noah's day, and Noah, you know, the Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. And, of course, we know, you know, he built the ark and this and that. And I'm just wondering, what was Noah preaching back in that day? We talked about this on Sunday school this morning, and the pastor really didn't have a defined answer as far as, you know, what there's no sermon recorded of what he was, you know, saying he gave some kind of, there's a Hebrews reference about Noah. But, I mean, what was Noah preaching? And I find it odd that there was only, you know, Noah saved his family on the boat, and, you know, we don't know how many people were there, but I would just think there would have been some stragglers that came on the boat, you know, just out of curiosity, but there was only eight people. And I'm just wondering what the message was. Yeah, they, you uh, know that that's Noah a, was preaching. good question. Well, he's called a preacher of righteousness, and uh, the Bible says, of course, Noah found grace. Keep in mind, it tells us one of the first things Noah did when he got off the ark is he offered sacrifice. Even the people who lived before the flood understood those sacrifices pointed to the day when God's son would come. That's why John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God taken away, takes away the sin of the world. So he was saying that, you know, there could be forgiveness for their sins. They had to get on the boat and repent. Well, you know, we have a little bit of an idea of what Enoch was preaching. You actually find in the book of Jude, it's the book just before the book of Revelation. Jude chapter 1, verse 14 says, now Noah, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about those you men mean Enoch. also saying, sorry, Enoch. Yeah. Oh, uh, you said Noah. Noah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was Enoch. <laughs> well, but they lived at the same time. They were, yeah. Yeah, so Enoch was a preacher of righteousness. And he, that's right. And what did he say? <laughs> well, that's too bad. I was so excited to share this. Yeah, I wasn't listening well, to the no, question. I thought he said Enoch. Anyway, it's a good question. Behold, the Lord comes well, with 10,000 of his is saints. Is it true that people the in the coming. Old Testament, they, they got saved by just knowing the glory of God, you know, just in creation itself before Christ? Well, they How were saved by grace. In the Old Testament. Yeah, even in the Old Testament, because God had talked to Adam face to face. In the Old Testament, uh, they understood the plan of salvation. You read in Revelation, it talks about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
And when Adam and Eve sinned, they tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. And God said, no, it's going to require a skin. And that's when the sacrificial system was introduced. The Bible says Abel believed in the blood of the lamb. And you can read about that in Hebrews, that Abel, you know, he he trusted in the blood of the lamb. Cain didn't want to, you know, believe in the sacrifice that pointed to the Son of God. So even these guys that lived before the flood, they were saved looking forward in faith Mm -hmm. to the sacrifice of Jesus. They were saved by grace. Nobody's saved by works. We're saved in, you know, we've got a better understanding because Jesus finally came. So we're saved by faith looking back, but everyone is saved by faith. A very good question. Eh? I appreciate that so much. And um, uh, I'm trying to think what we have on that. Oh, you got Last Night on Earth where it talks about Lot's wife. Yeah, you, that you might be a good book. talks about the time this. of Noah, too. The number to call is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the book called The Last Day on Earth. Our next call is Rebecca listening from Michigan. Rebecca, welcome to the program. It's an honor to meet you, sir. Likewise. And your it's question. Hard to meet. Yeah, um... I have a question. I'm dealing. I have low self-esteem, and I, I need some help to deal with this biblically. All right. Well, uh, first of all, if you want to know better what you are worth, uh, I just did a message on what a soul is worth, and and yeah. one of the ways you determine what something's worth is by what a person is willing to pay. They say it's worth whatever someone will pay. And what did someone pay for your soul? But God so loved you that He gave His Son which means that uh, that's the most valuable price that anybody's ever paid for anything is the creator himself gave himself to redeem you. Uh, Now, sometimes when we say self-esteem, we've got to be careful because, you know, God certainly wants us to understand our self-worth, but you don't want to be so self-conscious that it then turns into pride and selfishness where you're preoccupied with what your worth is. Uh, There's two dangers. You get one who doesn't think they're worth anything and some who think they're worth too much. (laughs) So, uh, There's a balance there for the Christian. You know, when we're crucified with Christ, we don't worry all the time about what other people think of us because we know what God thinks of us. So sometimes low self-esteem is because we're so concerned about what others think of us and we don't think we're worth a lot to them. But when we know what we're worth to God, that's, I think, that gives you the best balance and centering emotionally. And uh, the only one that we're really concerned about is what does God care and what does he think of us? But uh, hey, we really appreciate your question and hope that helps a little bit. Next Thank you, Rebecca. Next we have is Teresa listening in Alabama. Teresa, welcome to the program. Thank Teresa, you. are you there? Yes, I'm here. You're, right. you're on. Oh, hi. Hi, thanks for calling. Oh, uh, you're welcome. My concern was, is it biblical to tithe off of your uh, pension? Well, if you get, yeah, if you're, if you have earned a pension through your work over the years that when you, uh-huh. when you get a percentage back, you know, why wouldn't you want to pay a, a tithe on the increase? I mean, I have been, I just wondered, is it biblical though? Cause I didn't know where it was in the Bible, but I know it was the income coming in. Well, now let, let me just, I'll. It varies from one employer to another how the pension fund is built. Some government pensions, you don't ever really, you you work two years and you can get a 40-year pension. Uh, That's an exaggeration. Mm -hmm. But other people, the pension money is money that you've taken out of your paycheck every pay period. And you've already basically paid tithe on it because it's, if you're paying on the gross income, it's your money that you're putting into a fund. Sometimes the employers add to it, which would be new money, and then you'd want to pay tithe on that. So it could get complicated. But to keep it simple, I just find you can't outgive God. And God says, prove me. See if I don't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, take care of you. So I think whenever you're in Amen doubt, do, do the faithful thing. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. And we do have a study guide we'll send you for free on the subject of tithe. And it's called In God We Trust. You'll really enjoy it. The number to call is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the study guide called In God We Trust. Our next call is uh, Lois, listening in Washington. Lois, welcome to the program. Hi, good, afternoon. good evening, pastors. Evening. And this Lewis, right? Gotta, uh, hey, Lewis? Yeah. Luis. Oh. Luis. And your question. It's, it's a Mexican name. <laughs> uh, my question is about uh, the feast. 
I've been studying with uh, some people that um, keep the feast, and they bring this uh, passage to me. I cannot remember right now, but Paul uses this. Uh, he says, I'm going back to Jerusalem for the feast. Why is he saying that? And is this one of the feasts, the same ones that uh, Moses commands? Or yeah. Different. Well, no, Paul is going back to Jerusalem during the time of a Jewish feast. He wasn't doing that because he was requiring all Christians to keep the feast. Paul says clearly, I have become all things to all men that I might bring some to Christ. Paul says to the Jews, I became as under the law that I might reach those who are under the law. In other words, Paul said, look, in order to relate to the Jews, I'm going to go back and I'm going to observe the feasts and I'm going to try and meet them on their ground. He wasn't saying that everybody now needed to keep the feast because other places like Romans 14 and Colossians chapter 2, Paul's very clear. He says, you know, one man regards one day above another, another man regards every day alike. And um, he says, don't let anyone judge you regarding the, the uh, Sabbath days that are shadows of things to come. In yeah. Galatians, he talks I, well, about I, circumcision. And the, I some, got that all clear out. I mean, it, it's just that uh, they use the passage, and I'm like, Yeah, Paul is just you stating it. I don't have that. Well, that, that would <laughs> be, that you know, yeah. I, I was in the Philippines, and on Easter, I went to a festival to videotape something. Well, my going there didn't mean that I believed or agreed with the festival. Um, so by Paul That's saying, true. I'm going to celebrate this feast with them, well, when he was a Jew growing up, that's what he did. And now he's trying to reach his Jewish friends and family. And so it just states it as a fact. I think uh, Paul also realized this was a great evangelistic opportunity. You had Jews traveling from across the Roman Empire that mm-hmm. would just come to Jerusalem for these special feasts. What an opportunity to share with them about Christ and do evangelism. Yeah. And, you know, we do have a book, Luis, that talks about the feasts, and it's called Feast Days and Sabbaths. And uh, I've just written a new book because we get so many questions on the feasts and it should be in print pretty quick here because it's all done. And it's called, uh, Should a Christian Keep the Feasts? Should a Christian Keep the Feasts? So you call Amazing Facts and uh, I think we can send you a copy of that. Our next caller that we have is Tom listening from um, South Carolina. Tom, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you. Howdy, Doug. How you doing tonight? Sir? I'm doing good. Howdy to you, too, and your question yeah, good tonight. To, good to hear from you. I've uh, seen you lots of times at Judaluska. Oh, bless your heart. Yeah, camp meeting there. It's a beautiful yes, place. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I want to ask you a question, and I'll leave you alone. Uh, I've read in the Bible where that it talks about, uh, and I don't know the passage, Doug, promise, uh, where it talks about the uh, grapes and the fruit in heaven is going to be tremendously bigger uh, yeah. passage out of the Air Force. Well, that is actually assumed. And some yeah. people look at the story where the the, uh, the thieves go to, not the thieves, so I'm sorry, the spies. <laughs> the 12 spies go and they look at the promised land and they come back and the grapes are huge. And we assume other fruits were very big. And some have speculated that means that, you know, in heaven, if, the, if you've got gates made of a single pearl, and if it tells us that Joshua and Caleb brought back these huge clusters of grapes, how much bigger will the fruit be in heaven? I don't think, Pastor Ross, there's a verse that says no. the size of the fruit. It's just, just understood. fruit in heaven. Yeah. The, you know, different fruit so, trees. Yeah. It says, well, every man will plant, eat from his own vineyard and his own fruit tree. But it doesn't talk about the size of it. But I think it's safe to assume if they were that big in the promised land that in the heavenly promised land, they'll be bigger still. So, uh, yeah, good question. I tell you what, if if I'm wrong, when you get to heaven, I promise that I'll apologize. But I, I can almost guarantee you, you come to my house and there'll be some pretty big grapes. We're going to call them grapefruit. We, <laughs> Next caller that we have is Peter listening in Connecticut. Peter, welcome to the program. Yeah. Hello? Hey, hey, Peter, you're on the air, and I think we got about three minutes. Yeah, um, and my question is a, is a quick question. Um, I know about the, the Godhead but I just can't find the Trinity inside the Bible. Can you help me out with that? Yeah, well, you're not going to find the word Trinity. You're not going to find the word millennium in the Bible. As a matter of fact, you don't find the word Bible in the Bible. Trinity is just a theological term that means tri or three, like a tricycle's got three wheels, entities. It's the three persons of the Godhead. Nothing wrong with the term. Uh, in the Bible, it talks about God's eternal Godhead, and, but the, the teaching of the three persons of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Spirit, is found throughout the Bible. 
from creation yeah, where that, yeah. God says, let us make man in our image to the baptism where you see God the Father in heaven, God the Son is in the water, and God the Spirit is coming down like a dove. And Jesus says, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And, and there's a number of verses. Matter of fact, there's a, a book. We'll send you a free copy. And it's called The Trinity, Is It Biblical? Now, I wouldn't put much weight on the word Trinity. That's just a descriptive term. But the, uh-huh. the teaching of the three persons of the Godhead, I believe that is biblical. And uh, we'll send you a free copy of that book if you just ask. The number to call is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the book called The Trinity is a Biblical. We'd be happy to send it to anybody who calls and asks. Well, Pastor Dave, we're looking at the engineer over there on the other side of the glass. We're wondering how much time we have. Looks like we have a minute. It might not be enough time for us to take another caller. We'll probably end up cutting their call short. But you did mention a website on the break, and we just want to repeat that one more time if there were those who joined us. Just a great website for those who want to study the Bible in depth, in particular the time periods that we read about in the Bible. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's got illustrations. You can click on the different Bible characters, a little windows pop up that give more information, tells when they were born, when they died. There's you know, some that are question marks, but uh, you'll be able to see how their lives overlapped see that Samson lived just a little while before David and it just helps you realize who their heroes were and and uh, the the time scale it's called biblehistory.com biblehistory.com we know you'll enjoy that hey friends if we didn't get your call this week God willing we'll be back next week and we'd love to hear from you amazingfacts.org thank you for listening to today's broadcast we hope you understand your Bible even better than before Tune in next time for more Bible Answers Live. Honest and accurate answers to your Bible questions. Life's a curious thing. I mean, just when things seem under control, wham, you're hit with something new. Your marriage, your job, your health. You could look to the stars, but they don't have the answers. But this does. The Prophecy Study Bible by Amazing Facts. It's 27 personal study guides lead you on a life-changing journey. Get yours today by calling 800-538-7275. Amazing Facts, through your faithful support, has had a major impact on some of the largest non-Christian locations in the world. Beyond the Great Wall, the printing and translation of our books and video materials are in constant motion. The Amazing Facts Chinese language website is now one of our most visited websites. We also translated thousands of pieces of literature for these nations. What started out as hundreds of followers is now in the hundreds of thousands. The impact of your funds invested in sharing the everlasting gospel in these foreign lands will be felt for years to come. You know, every week we hear the most incredible stories from all over the globe of lives that are being changed and hearts that are being transformed by the power of the Word. And none of it could happen without your teamwork with this ministry. God bless you. Find out what the critics are raving about. Top scholars and theologians from around the country come together to reveal the hidden history of the book of Revelation. With powerful reenactments and incredible visual effects, this 95-minute masterpiece brings to life the book of Revelation like never before. Revelation is no longer a mystery. Get your copy today. Visit iTunes or afbookstore.com. Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts Media Library at AFTV.org. At AFTV.org, you can enjoy video and audio presentations as well as printed material all free of charge. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit AFTV.org. If you'd like to enhance your study of God's Word, visit our website at www.amazingfacts.org and sign up for our free Bible study course. And make sure to check out our online bookstore at afbookstore.com, which offers thousands of inspiring books, DVDs, and more to help you get the most out of God's Word. To take advantage of the offers you've heard on this broadcast, 
call us at 800-835-6747 or visit our website at amazingfacts.org.